Okay, Chuck, let's talk about you. Chuck received his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Louisiana State University in 1992. Um, Mr. Berger has been in state service for 25 years. You are dating yourself. You need to be more like him. Just say a long time. <laughs> His career began with the Department of Transportation and Development in 1993, but he wasn't that happy there, so he moved on to bigger and better things. Uh, he joined in 1996 the Department of Environmental Quality, and they put him in a cubicle, and they were shocked to find out he's still there. Is that about what happened? Yeah. Huh? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I I've picked on you enough. He called you mayor. I know. Exactly. We're the same age. Ain't, okay, so my voice wasn't enough. <laughs> Anything you hear me talking about today, I am not the expert on this. I'll say that right out the bat, uh, and we'll give credit to those who assisted with us, but uh, we're going to be talking about our anti-degradation policy, and basically it is a component of water quality standards. Um, you know, it's listed in the Code of Federal Regulations, and then we also had to have the policy and implementation policy uh, in our uh, state regulations. So, first, uh, the four components of, of standards are, are you have the designated use is set for each water body, and then uh, and those might be fish and wildlife propagation, primary contact recreation, and whatever those designated uses are, that's uh, used to set up the criteria. So the criteria is set to be protective of the designated use. So then the third component of our standards is the anti-degradation policy. And that's to uh, basically maintain and protect the existing uses. And uh, then we have some general policies to deal with low flows and variances and mixing, mixing zones. All right, so all states are required to have an anti-degradation policy and identify the methods they're gonna to use to implement such a policy. Um, the policy must include, at a minimum, three levels of protection. We commonly refer to those as tiers, which we'll discuss uh, in, a, in the next couple of slides. Um, there's also an issue with the thermal discharges. So tier one, is uh, basically where the, the water, bo all water bodies must meet the existing criteria and designated uses. Um, I like, uh, you know, I want to thank Kim for these slides, for most of them, but in plain English, water quality standards that support existing uses may not be violated. Um, tier two gets a little more in depth. <laughs> Uh, I'll just switch to the in plain English part. Um, basically, for uh, where water bodies where the water qu quality is better than the criteria, a socioeconomic analysis is required before allowing any lowering of the water quality. Um, this level of protection does apply to selected water bodies and the burden of identifying tier two water bodies lies with each state. And that's, I think, uh, proves to be very uh, complex issue. Um, some of the, wait, let me step back here a second. Yeah, all right. Um, in 2015, they came out with some additional restrictions, basically saying that when uh, designating tier two waters, the state shall not exclude a water body from protection solely because the water quality does not exceed levels to, necessary to, to support all of designated uses. So basically what you're looking at there is um, just because some of the parameters aren't meeting the criteria, that is not a factor to, to prohibit it from being uh, a tier two water body. Um, lowering of the water quality may only be allowed after an alternatives 
analysis is completed. And this is some areas where we have some concerns for uh, new dischargers or expanding dischargers. Uh, it could be quite an additional burden possibly on them and as well as on the state. So tier three, this gets to the fun part. Um, these are outstanding water bodies, have really great water quality, ideally. Um, we have a, a number of uh, what we have designated as outstanding natural resource waters, and tier three applies to those water bodies. Basically, no degradation of water quality is allowed in water bodies designated as an ONRW or other exceptional water bodies as designated by the states. Um, St. Tammany, you've got a number of ONRWs out there. Um, in, in this issue, the reason we're talking about this today is it uh, something that has been uh, kicked to a, a higher level of, of uh, discussion, you know. Um, fourth component of the policy is that uh, in those cases where potential water quality impairment associated with the thermal discharge is involved, the anti-degradation policy and implementing method shall be consistent with Section 316 of the Act. So here's an, uh, just a, uh, an example of what we're talking about with the three tiers. Basically, tier one, all states are tier, all water bodies are tier one. They've got to meet the existing uh, water quality protective of the designated uses. So tier two is basically water bodies that have a water quality that is better than this, whatever the standards are, so you've essentially got some extra in there, some reserve, um, but you must uh, justify why we should uh, allow degradation in those water bodies. And like I said, the degradation can, uh, I mean, the, uh, the justification can include uh, a socioeconomic analysis, um, some sort of analysis to determine how much of degradation we're talking about, and um, an alternatives analysis. And then tier three is, you know, ideally the best of the best. Um, basically, no, no the, the de water quality cannot be degraded at all. So big issue there is what is not at all. How much degradation is a, a de minimis, you know? Um, section 11, 09 of our anti-degradation policy. The state may choose to allow water quality in waters that exceed the standards to accommodate justifiable, justifiable economic and or social development, but not to the extent of violating established water quality standards. So this is basically the language for our tier two protections of waters of high quality. Um, additionally, no degradation shall be allowed in the high quality waters that constitute outstanding natural resource waters. Um, in our state, we have 67 subsegments that are outstanding natural resource waters. Uh, 29 of those are in the Lake Pontchartrain Basin, so a, a fairly uh, dense concentration of them in the Lake Pontchartrain Basin. Um, for those water bodies where, you know, uh, new dischargers uh, that are looking to discharge into an ONRW, um, or it might be an existing discharger looking to increase their loading. Basically, we're doing modeling for those to determine if they're gonna have an impact. And uh, in some cases, we've seen that it looks like it would, so it results in more stringent permit limits. Um, the plan, our, our implementation plan includes several interrelated water quality programs such as permitting, water quality monitoring, enforcement, um, and of course our TMDL section and modeling section. Um, it also includes requirements for specific processes used in each phase of implementation to be included in the state's continuing planning process document. So some of the challenges, uh, there's no guidance that exists for developing specific anti-degradation Im implementation procedures. Um, <coughs> there is some regional guidance available, but for not for, for Region 6, which is the region that Louisiana is in. Um, challenge of permitting in Tier 3, three water bodies. Um, 
modeling has shown this, that uh, some of the facilities are having potential impacts leading to more stringent permit limits. Um, we're having some uh, concerns and challenges identifying the tier two water bodies. As Al mentioned, we've got uh, about 500 subsegments that we divided the state into. There's uh, roughly 18 different parameters I think we sample and assess against. So how do you decide which are those tier two water bodies we talked about? Um, there's two viable approaches, either parameter by parameter or water body by water body. So, um, and we'll explain that a little more in a second. At what level above the criteria is truly better water quality? Um, may require additional justification burden on permittees and the force of, form of the socioeconomic analysis and impact and alternatives analysis. And then again, as I said, what is the de minimis discharge? And then, of course, creating guidelines for permittees and uh, you know, what's a good socioeconomic analysis. Um, the water body by water body approach is basically looking at all, taking each water body and looking at all the parameters that we assessed against and making a determination that it should be a tier two water body. And then parameter, parameter by parameter, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong here, is it's more uh, looking at the individual parameters and it may be a tier two for some parameters and a tier two for not for other parameters. Then there's also been a third option that's been discussed is some combination of the two. Um, continues to be a hot bush issue. Um, EPA has tasked each region with developing an implementation guidance document and they're working closely with the states to develop and or refine their implementation procedures. Um, and we're working on our implementation procedures document. Um, previous drafts had to be discarded due to the changes that we mentioned that were, came in August of 2015. Um, implementation procedures may include the tier two identification process, uh, socioeconomic analysis, alternatives analysis procedures, and then the guidance for permit applicants requesting to discharge to tier two water bodies. So also uh, probably over the last two years I've done at least about six of these models or so um, working on the seventh one it's a pretty big one um, so it, again there's a lot more activity now economy is better people are starting to build and expand more so we're getting more of these requests in the and the ones I've been doing are all in the Bogofalai and the Chifuncta area um, so we're getting a lot of growth out there and it results in us having to model it and determine what type of impact it's likely to have. Um, I don't know anything about these two uh, case laws, but apparently uh, the first one upheld the water body by water body approach and it required a cumulat cumulative uh, cap on the diminished discharges. And then the second um, case law upheld EPA's the decision that uh, a 10% degree decrease in assimilative capacity from a single discharger is de minimis and did not uphold EPA's decision that a cumulative cap of 20% is a de minimis. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. It's hard. But I know we, you just recently went through this. Yeah, yeah. we had to do a modeling study for uh, Adam and yeah. And it, it's a process. It is. It is. So, I mean, it, but, but I, we didn't appreciate the, the yeah. Oh, yeah. We didn't okay. appreciate the process until we were like, okay. It, it, I mean, it's definitely it really is. It's very in depth. And, and not only that, they had to also deal with um, the department. Um, wildlife and fisheries so we got through D. well D. that's the other side I wanted to mention is uh, these are RWs a lot of them were set based on what wildlife and fisheries has said as their scenic streams yeah so um, they are scenic rivers for the state as well so they got to have a scenic rivers permit so uh, wildlife and fisheries is also looking at our model as models to determine if they're gonna give a, a scenic rivers permit yeah so it, it was uh, it was twofold for us to get through the process but yeah I mean 
they worked with us and it was nice because they would keep us up to date on where they were. So you mean they, you're talking as Chuck. in Chuck, yeah, okay. my buddy Chuck would say, yeah, here's where I am. Here's where I plan to be. <laughs> so that I, you know, we could at least let the developer know where he was in the process. So they actually said, well, you're, you're second in line right now. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't make the news, you just deliver the news and you're right in there with us, right? Yeah. You don't make the news. Oh yeah, you can't get too close to that speaker. That's yeah. why it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any questions for our friend Chuck here? Yes? I More told questions? you you should break them up. I know. I know. They're feeding off each other. Okay. Who has a question? Yeah. Yeah. Who else would have a question? Good point. Good point. We too have been concerned about the anti-degradation uh, policies of DEQ. Um, because of our large amount of development, we worked with DEQ uh, to, we now have the TMDL models for all of the rivers in St. Tammany Parish and a few extras that have been developed for us by the CPRA. We call them our post-TMDL models because they've been upgraded for uh, additional dischargers and extra flows and things like that. In the process, we are now testing every commercial development and every subdivision that comes through to look at water quality impact. We're looking at wastewater and stormwater. And we haven't gotten to the point, well, we've seen a couple of failures and they're being dealt with by putting additional BMPs or rerouting the sewer. But our big concern is what happens when we reach that tipping point where it does fail the anti-degradation in some of these really dense watersheds like Chifuncto, where it's heavily developed or developing. We're not quite sure where to go with that policy. Talk to you. You want me to talk to you offline for that? I did turn my mic off. Hey, you want to explain the maps you did for us? Um, but, or is that part of another one? I well, know. just to say, you know, we're facing that same issue. You know, like I said, uh, uh, you're kind of growing with the process because you're seeing that this is being. <laughs> Look, he's getting all red faced. Lisa, you only need Chuck alone. Yeah, I, I like picking on Chuck. She's not me. <laughs> but look, I, look, look, I get to stand up here, right? You know? So. It feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. I do that all the time. <laughs> um, you know, we're starting to look at things a little more in depth because, um, you know, not just looking at the DO, but looking at the other parameters and trying to figure out how to determine what is de minimis there. We've used a de minimis, and it's been established for the dissolved oxygen of 0.2 milligrams per liter. Because basically that's, that's within the uh, allowable margin of error for the equipment that's used to measure the dissolved oxygen. So, um, but we're starting to look, because it's, you know, I've always, it, for me it's always been about the load as well, not just whether DO recovers or not, but it's about the load, the, the change in load because that shows up downstream somewhere. Um, but so we're looking at that as well and trying to kind of maybe innovate a little bit and creatively think on how to, to, to look at that and, and evaluate that. And it's done that on some recent ones. And like I said, it's in some cases, um, you know, just with all, with the, the models have limitations, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you add a bunch of flow to a small stream, it's gonna, Reiterate out the world, you know, but uh, is that real? You know, you start to question that, and so um, we started looking at other things as well. And it's resulted, like I said, in some more stringent limits where we see, okay, yeah, there's a, uh, you know, there appears to be some degradation here, and we start, you know, looking at adjusting the permit limits to see at what level do we get that desired impact degradation. Yeah within an acceptable limit. So would you handle it with additional BMPs on the site, or would you handle it with volume control on the site? Yeah, like, yeah, once so you, you do establish that, she's trying to figure out, like, how to, how to deal with it. Yeah. I don't step across that line. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take, kick it to DHH? That usually works. No, but uh, for us, <laughs> no. I mean, you know, we're just looking at the results in stream. Yeah. But whatever leads to improved water quality, mm -hmm. you know. I, but it does. It, it gets oh. tough, a real world example. Here we go. 
Ganey's has four projects in West Monroe. How does that happen, right? So I'm up in West Monroe last week, and I am five miles north of West Washita High School, south of the interstate, in absolutely rural North Louisiana. And working with the developers there, they have two projects, this one that was permitted at 3030 by DHH, and they're waiting on their permit. And then their other one that discharges into Lake Dar, maybe it's Bayou Darbone. Does anybody know Lake Darbone? It is lovely, isn't it? It is as remote a lake as you could imagine. So my question is, how in these absolutely <coughs> remote locations with no population density, is this considered degradation when you would have to think with temperature and, and, and plant decay, you, ha you have a naturally low DO condition. So isn't a lot of this back to that question, is that natural or is that, is that uh, uh, some, some man-made deprivation? That's, that's a question. I just, I, just, I, I look at this, how can, how can this be in remote North Louisiana? Well, and they, uh, in, yeah, there's cases where a lot of that is natural, you know, but does that mean the additional man-made loading should be allowed there? A lot of the streams, their hydrology is determined how much they're going to assimilate, you know, so there's limitations from the beginning. You know, if you've got an area with higher slope, you know, and it has no DO problems. If you've got an area with no slope, yeah. then it's just a sluggish extended lake there, yeah. it's, and, and it's hot. No tree covered, no tree canopy. It's going to be open to the sun. You're going to have DO problems there. That's what we described with the the issues, which we'll talk about later this afternoon, with the dissolved oxygen. That's a teaser. And then looking at reevaluating that criteria in certain areas. You know, I think that's really more what you're you're hitting on there. Is the criteria correct? That that's what I'm hitting on. Yep. So, so you just plug later well, on the day. Well, you know, God was a wastewater engineer, and uh, we have all the... Why did you say God was a chemist? Which is he? Yeah. Well, his undergraduate degree was in chemistry, but then he proceeded on. And so, <laughs> so the natural environment is going to take care of a percentage of this, right? And, and in North Louisiana, there has to be plenty of facility for that to continue to happen. So are we, are we hurting ourselves by putting undue constraint on economic development? in areas where it probably was a low DO condition anyway. Yeah, I think that's what they're going to be looking at as a reevaluation. But you're getting us off topic right there. Well, okay. do you have a permit stamp that I could borrow? <laughs> you don't want to lie. No, to no one's giving you their stamp. No, he keeps hoping that some engineer is going to die and put that in their wheel. So don't do that. 